Hey everybody, I hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm here at Lurson Marston with Gavin. All right. And Ruben, how are you? Hey. Very excited to be here. We've done some work together over the years. You guys, to me, do probably the finest analog sounding stuff out there. Is that okay to say on camera? The digital stuff is getting much better. It's really coming along, but uh, we model everything on an analog signal. That's how I was trained. That's how he was trained. That's where we go. That's what people know us for. And I was very excited when I got told about your plugin because I thought, here's guys that work, I wouldn't say exclusively, but a lot in the analog realm, whether it be tape, working with guys like obviously T-Bone has been a huge part of your career. I mean, oh, yeah. some of the best sounding records with lots yeah. of Grammys and things that came from it. Got a couple of those. <laughs> and so that's wonderful. And I think that it was exciting to me because that means that you come with that skill set and you come with those ears. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I was trained by Doug Sachs and uh, by default, that was the equipment being used. That That's what, what his expertise was. That's how I grew up. That's how I came up. Um, Ruben came in, got trained in the same way. Um, but we're living in an age now where digital technology is really, you know, doing doing great and starting to really replicate uh, audio playback of a captured performance in a in a pretty wonderful way. So, you know, we just have to keep up with the standards and continue to combine the analog digital technology and know when to tilt it one way or the other and how to integrate them. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people call on us and are, gravitate towards us for those types of sensibilities, but also how that's implemented to more virtual and modern types of recordings, you know, where that's arrangements that are more virtually based. So having one foot kind of in that world and then also one foot in the analog world too. I agree. There's yeah. no yeah. substitute for acquired knowledge. So tell me a little bit about your equipment here, please. Well, our analog chain consists of benchmark converters. So the first stage is a benchmark D to A converter, which is actually this guy. And that's what feeds our console. And we alter the D to A level per each mix, depending on the gain structure we mm -hmm. want to run into the console. Nice. Um, so we generally, you know, we can change the chain of events for anything, and we do. Um, so we have to first listen to a mix, feel it out, see where, see where it's going. Um, and very often, we really enjoy the sound of this EAR tube equalizer. And this would be something we'd typically patch in directly out of the D to A and before our console. So you're come into, coming into it, hitting it at a, at a particular level that's determined by ear and by feel out of the D to A converter. Um, we can adjust the level of the mix digitally, but we prefer to do it on the analog stage. Um, makes sense. From the EAR, you know, we can patch this anywhere in the chain, as I said, but typically speaking, we, we like to come into this first because beyond its ability to brilliantly EQ music, does th there's, there's almost, I don't want to say it, but almost a compression feel to it in, mm -hmm. in the sense that it, it glues things together. There's a feel to this piece of gear that makes us want to put it before our console. We really like this GML. 9500. This is um, something that George Massenberg developed in the 90s, and it's just a beautiful piece of gear. It's very clean, very transparent, um, and it'll, you know, we'll use it a lot when we're trying to increase punch on something. Um, of course, we've got some uh, manly equipment, as most people do. Uh, we pull that out when we need it. Um, Sonically, what are you, what are you finding? You use that for? What is it doing for you that? Uh... Um, when we use that piece of gear, we like to use it in combination with the Allen Smart C1. Um, it's a, it's a, on, a, on, on a fair amount of music, you'll see these two patched in together. Um, we'll go in and out of this, barely, barely touching it, barely tickling it. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a feel thing. You know, uh, so much of our chain has to do with going through the electronics of a piece of gear. Sure. And um, I find that when you put a chain together, and you use really high-end equipment and a little bit of processing from each gear, mm -hmm. you can actually combine a fair amount of things in the chain, getting the best out of everything to create a, a vibrancy to your music than if you use one piece of gear to slam it and try to accomplish something. So um, a lot of this gear is the feel of the equipment itself, the design of the electronics, 
Um, and in something like this, a piece of gear like this, it, again, it would be to glue it together. If, mm -hmm. if we're feeling that the mix might be a little bit um, needing some reining in, uh, this piece of gear will do a very good job of that. No, I mean, that's part of the, the wonderful thing about an experience of me as a producer or a, or a mixer yeah. is going into a mastering room and going, Again, you know, I learned something from you yeah. talking to you, but I learned something from using my own ears in an environment where the room is tuned really well and I can actually hear everything. Is, your, is the antelope the last, is that your last thing in your change going back well, in digital or? Well, there's a few, there's a few clocking places. Um, uh, we use uh, the Sonic Studio interface, the Model 303, which goes up to 192, uh, and we clock that externally. We do every, uh, we, we, we clock everything externally. Okay. All, all with the antelope equipment. And Great. We also clock the output of the the mix that comes into the D-Day, as I mentioned before, using uh, UA equipment and also clocking that with the, with the antelope. Great. So we use antelope clocking for everything, benchmark uh, conversion A to D, D to A for everything, and um, a couple of different interfaces for different purposes. So in the case of Sonic, what we'll do you know, we, you'll see various other pieces of gear, and then we can actually bring other pieces of gear in as well. Uh, DS are up here. We also have a Masalek um, Prism EQ, which can do what this does, but does it differently. Obviously, it's not in the room at the moment. Um, and what we'll do is we'll capture into Sonic Studio. Yep. And we will then, at Unity Gain, we've got this all lined up and figured out, we will be able to play our capture through an additional D to A at a different place in our console. So what we can do is do a capture of one of your mixes, mm -hmm. listen to the other mix, work on it, check it, you know, plat versus EQ, and then check it against the capture that we have. And Great. we get everything lined up at unit again so we can meticulously check the levels of the mixes as they go down. Wonderful. Yeah. And then this last stage here, this is your attenuation here? Yeah, this is our console. This, this um, is in line generally before all this gear. Um, and some of the time, as I'd mentioned, this will come in before our console. I see. Yeah, so this is our attenuation and various other little switch things we can switch in and out. And Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, let's talk some speakers. Yes. Now, the, is your main listening speakers the ATCs? Yeah, ATC 150s. How long have you been using those? Um, I've been using them the whole time. The whole time, so um, you know them well. I know them very well, Great. yes. We got these, and we have another pair of... Uh, them the 50s model too. These are the 150s. It's great. We have them in another room. Well, that reinforces the point that we always hear, like know your speakers and know your room. And they're British. Oh, are they? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got to know your we speakers. We won't hold that against them. <laughs> you've got to know your speakers. Yeah, it, the speakers will tell you the truth. They'll tell you everything you need to know. Yeah. Now, the JBLs I see hanging out, is that for when you're doing five ones? Those are in the room for uh, some 5.1 projects. Uh, we also bring in ATC 25s for surround sound projects as well. Wonderful. Yeah. And just as a sign is that are you getting much of that stuff these days? More and more. It's, okay, great. It's starting to happen again, yeah. So, Ruben. Hey. <laughs> tell me a bit about yourself. You're Canadian. I am. But so nobody, nobody know that. really knows that about I didn't me. Know that, no. Yeah, I mean, I'm very, I'm very much American at this point. I've been in in California since I was nine years old, Santa Barbara, and then moved moved to LA when I was a teenager, eighteen. That explains. And and started working in mastering right away. I got a job at the mastering lab uh, in Hollywood, um, and that's wow. where I, I met Gavin and and the team there, and uh, been have been mastering ever since. How did you get the job? A uh, family friend was was uh, next door neighbors with Gavin. And, yep. and we met that way, and I started interning there, and then was assisting, and just kind of fell into place that way. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I had some friends that were doing a lot of pop and hip hop, so I kind of cut my teeth doing a lot of that uh, early on. Um, guys like Ari Levine from the Schmeezingtons, before they were even the Schmeezingtons, uh, were doing a whole lot of records like that. So um, was working on a whole bunch of productions that Bruno Mars was producing uh, before he was known to be what he is now. Uh, we're putting together records for guys like Far East Movement and uh, Travi McCoy and um, different projects like that. So developing, you know, learning from what I, you know, learning from Gavin in terms of how to pass sound through, you know, different, different uh, types of uh, way, you know, things are patched and understanding how it all travels through the, the gear. 
uh, developing different techniques on how to make hip hop just sound larger than life and pop records. So developing sounds with, with Ari and really learning um, all of that, kind of a combination of real, real, uh, true organic analog recordings and then also more virtual, you know, type of uh, arrangements, you know, and then kind of marrying that all together. And of course, you know, we're, we're fortunate to not be pigeonholed to one particular genre uh, where we, we span all genres, you know. So just coming to work every day, you know, one day is working on a, a beautifully crafted orchestral uh, soundtrack or some really nice jazz and, you know, heavy rock. You know, we, we did everything under the sun, so, you know, every day was different. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about tape. Now, obviously, when you first started, there was probably a lot of stuff that was coming on tape. Yeah, I mean, we still get a fair amount, you know. Um, a lot of times we, we get both tape and digital, mm -hmm. and there's so many different ways that, you know, a record can be brought to us. You know, sometimes they mix completely analog, they sum it completely analog, it goes to tape, and then they have a split feed off the console, then go into a converter, and it's digital. Uh, and, you know, we'll do a shootout. We'll, we'll master from both sources and we'll figure out which one uh, just feels like it lights up the room. And, you know, it, it can be subjective too. You know, somebody might have an opinion. Generally, the producer is the one that makes the call or the mixing engineer. Sometimes it's the artist. And a lot of times they'll also trust us to make that decision, you know, if they're not quite sure. Well, you made a very interesting point off camera, which um, I loved, and that is if, you're, if you are going to mix to tape, you have to think in that realm, you have to, for instance, I remember talking to Tommy Vicari and he said one of the problems with early digital was yes, it was brittle, but also because people were thinking like tape. So they were sitting there like boosting the high end because they were expecting to hear back something that didn't right. have as much high end. So reversely where we're at now, if you're gonna mix two tape, you have to think differently. That's absolutely, and you know, that's, it's an interesting thing because we're, we're faced with the same thing with using digital tools and bus compression. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're mixing into something that's doing something, you're making all your mix decisions while monitoring through a process, then that's your mix. Similar to going to tape, if you're mixing to tape, you're monitoring through that's what's, what's happening to the sound when it's going to that. If you mix it, make all your mix decisions, then go to tape, you're adding a process. In mm -hmm. a sense, uh, you know, especially if you're mixing digitally and the project is already digital, and then you're going through a D to A and going to tape, you're going through all these steps. You're going through the conversion step. You're going through the record electronics of the tape machine. Then the playback electronics of our tape machine feeding the console. You could end up in a place where it's not quite what it was meant to be, or at least what the mixing engineer intended it to be. It's kind of taken a side road, you know. So all of these things we take into account when picking the best source. But we don't have to necessarily even think about it. We just put it up and intuitively we get the sense of what just feels right. You know, we are talking about with the, with the plug-in, why... It's exciting that you guys are doing it because honestly, when I first heard that you were doing it, I was like, really? Those guys are doing a digital something and they're so analog, but then you're like, well, whether they're bringing all that wealth of knowledge and applying it to that world. Yeah, I mean, it was really important for us to, I mean, we, you know, to sound digital Mm -hmm. often get such a bad rap, you know? Sure. And when I think if somebody says, hey, it sounds digital, it means all the negative things that can come from digital, you know, sounding pointed or edgy or, or hashy or harsh, you know? So when we, when we developed that, uh, that tool, it was very important to us that it shouldn't sound that way, you know? So we worked in, you know, these different arc curves to, to complement the compression, everything working as one process, um, so it feels nice and analog. You know, and of course, there's different ways of go. You know, just like just like on the console. You know, it's I think of, I think of it the same way. You know, there's there's ways to make things sound like it. You know, so you're not hearing even if it was mixed digital. Maybe it comes in a little bit harsh and edgy and pointed. You know, we have ways of of making sure we can brighten something, open it up, but take away the the point. You know, so um, there's all different types of techniques to make it feel nice and lush and big and and also smooth on top. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, so what I love is that you have this experience in the analog world. You've been doing this for a few years, young Kevin. You know, two or three. Couple. <laughs> we won some of these Grammy things over here. <laughs> um, no, and I, we've worked together, so I know, I, I yeah. know your, your aesthetic is definitely around the analog world. And when this plug-in first came out, I was kind of surprised. I was thinking to myself, this is, this is like one of the most analog guys I know. And you prided yourself on dynamics. That's one of the first things. 
Like I remember coming in with a song and you like pushed choruses yeah. and brought down and worked the song in a very musical kind of way. Yeah. So it seemed to me it was really exciting that somebody who comes from such an analog world would even think about doing something digital. Yeah. So that's a big deal. For me, it's like there's many mastering engineers that I know that work entirely in the box and don't even leave the box to come in, you know, to come back in, in into the digital world. So for me, it's a big deal that you would do this. Um, and also, I think the thing that I get asked about all the time whenever I talk to any mastering engineers on any video, whether it be Warren or Howie or Adam or Brian, is everybody's like, well, I want to I want to see what they do. So this is a perfect opportunity, not just to show off a plugin that you've got, but probably, quite frankly, more importantly, to sort of understand the process of mastering. OK, so we have a song, um, which is a prog song here. And I'd like to hear what you guys would do. Maybe, Ruben, you can demonstrate uh, the, the, the process of that and maybe also how we ride into the courses and keep those dynamics alive. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the way we developed this tool is, is inspired based off how we work day in, day out using the analog console. And that's how we work every day. Um, and it's a philosophy that uh, inspires the user to utilize our workflow instead of kind of being lost in all of these different processes and trying to make sense of it all. Um, the, the way we work is not just by adding one process and then adding another process on top of that. You know, some people feel that mastering is, and for some it may be, not for us, but you might take a, a song and add some EQ to it and then listen to it and then see how that sounds and then add some compression and then some limiting and, and so on and so forth. And our, and our process is more of a global process. You, you, uh, you listen to the material at hand and then you pick a certain type of workflow, a certain type a of chain. a chain yeah. um, from, from point A to point B and understand how those, all those individual processes work together in, in combination to create this end result and all the processes favor and complement each other rather than one kind of in any way fighting. Uh, so you don't want to create a scenario where you take even nine steps forward and then one step back. You know, you want to just take 10 steps forward. So it's um, a holistic approach with great. equipment. It's it's three equalizers and two compressors and perhaps a de-esser. Not because you're trying to de-ess something. Maybe you want to push a little EQ uh, a little harder than you might want to to get a bite onto it. And then you'll use a compressor, uh, a de-esser as a compressor to push down on that a little bit and get sure. get a bite without ascending to digital and, and edgy. So there's a holistic approach to picking a chain behind a genre of music. It's not always as simple as that when somebody comes in we have to experiment and find the right chain um, but we find ourselves in many cases uh, being consistent in the way we put a chain together for a genre of music and that's what we built into into this mm -hmm. as a right. starting point it just gets you down the road and you'll still have to do some some work yourself but uh, it, it gets you going without being confused with the massive stuff out there mm -hmm. all right so let's check out this track it's being prog rock 10 minutes long <laughs> uh, um, let's so start. Take a section. Yeah, I'll start in the middle. So this is just the unprocessed uh, file. Okay, great. So um, what we can do is pick a starting point. Um, and there's, there's, there's various starting points to start from in terms of how all this gear works uh, together. You'll notice right now I'm using pop rock. It doesn't mean that you can only use pop rock for pop rock type of arrangement. It's just a... a uh... It's an indicator of the chain. Right. So we can, for instance, go to hip hop. And you'll notice that we have a different uh, chain. Or you can go to Americana Loose, and we have a different type of chain there too. You'll notice the difference between Americana Loose and Pop Rock is this tube limiter. This is more of a vintage type of tube limiter. And this is on Pop Rock, more of a modern type of tube limiter. Um, and the chain is it works in the in in this in these steps. It starts with a tube EQ, then a solid state EQ, 
a tube limiter, a solid state de -esser, which we use as kind of a high frequency limiter, and then a solid state compressor at the end of the chain. Um, and then underneath the hood, there's also a brick wall limiter at the very end. That's, that's, and, it's, and it works. You can't actually uh, adjust that. That works in combination with all these other processes, right. as I was explaining before. So uh, one cool thing to do is let's just put it in. Uh, now we're going to hear it. I'm going to turn the input drive way down, and I'm going to gain up until I start hearing the compressing, compression grabbing. So you can, you can play around with this. You can go a little further and see how that grabs. And then you can back it off a little bit and you'll see the elements within the mix will kind of expand a little bit more. So you can fine tune and, and play with where you want to start. And you can see that as you juice in to this particular preset that you start hearing maybe, well, all the compre both compressors grabbing, everything kind of grabbing a little bit. Um, so you might want to EQ into that grab, if you will, to create this, this effect where it expands open. So this track, once Going into the compression, uh, we want to crack it open in the mids and upper mids a little bit. Maybe tighten the bottom a little bit too. Sure. So now I'm going to do that. And you can, you can play around with this for a long time, but already you can kind of hear that there's a glue. Everything is kind of gluing together, but at the same time opening up on top. And with that, it creates an end result where it expands in all directions. You get this nice dimension and some, some real nice lush support, support sure. of bottom, but at the same time your ear is on that guitar solo, whereas maybe it wasn't before I EQ'd it as much. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah I like what's going on. I, think, I feel like the unprocessed track sounds like when when the music came down to let the guitar breathe it didn't really come down uh -huh. there's so much like low mids going on in there uh -huh. so you're combating it here by say boosting some of the high mids yeah it, it, well you know one one cool thing using this type of compression when you when you juice more around 3k yeah. it kind of moves the bottom upward sure. right so uh you're creating some support instead of just taking out the bottom you're actually you know maybe maybe creating a little bit more of a boost above it, which sure. kind of brings it up and then maybe just dip down the lows a little bit and all of a sudden you got some nice low mid support. Sure. You know, so there's different ways of doing it. Sometimes people say, hey, I got too much bottom on this track and they start scooping out bottom. Mm -hmm. Whereas it might feel better if you start adding above the bottom and then sure. it just breathes open. Yeah, that's the age old discussion is it boost rather than cut. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that we uh, also pride ourselves in, as you say, the dynamics, um, very often because we're doing uh, analog work, every day on all this music, you'll, you'll see us uh, every time making all these moves as the song's going down. It's not a preset, uh, if you come and work with us in the studio, it's us manually writing this old yeah. school. And we've built that in here too. There's a functionality that we can show you about. But essentially what we like to do, once you get your chain working and the compression going and everything's just right, if the dynamics of the mix come in and there, you know, goes to a lower section, those compressors are going to open up. So we have to follow that. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're actually reducing level. It's, it's one of the moves we make often, uh, not always, but often. Uh, we'll, we'll follow the level, we'll attenuate during those sections. We're not actually lowering level, we're, we're following it into the limiter so that we can retain and maintain the dynamics that were intended Absolutely. by the mixer. And uh, we've accounted for that in the, in the plugin as well. We can show you how that works. Yeah, show, yeah. show me that. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'm going to start from this section, and you'll see that this section, just after it, um, I'm going to make a ride using this push knob. And what this push knob does is it moves all of the five bands of the EQ relative to one another. So essentially, you can think of it as saturating or saturating less, depending on where you are in the song and section by section.
coming out of this section. Small little moves like this can really add a whole lot of dynamic and character to your mastering process. And, you know, you can automate that to fine tune exactly where you want it to hit. Um, I did a little manual demonstration of that. If necessary. It's not always necessary. If you want to get in there and uh, take, take your work further and really play around and even increase or change the dynamic structure of the music beyond the mix, these are the options available. Should you right. choose? And a lot of times we're not only writing uh, just all bands or, or some bands, but for instance, if you have a big build up in a song mm -hmm. and you start hearing the compression grab a little bit more, sure. uh, you might want to open it up with some EQ and that even expands it further and makes it you know, grow in all directions like I was explaining before. You can use it as a, stand, as a standalone yep. pl plugin also um, completely, or you can use it in any DAW. Okay, great. Yeah. So, with all automation, we can sit there and you can write in all the EQ points. I mean, that's the, that is the wonderful advantage of digital, let's be honest. It's like you can go back and audition it 50 times. You know, when I've watched Gavin work, for instance, it's all in real time and it's magic. It really is because it's, it's making decisions on the fly. Obviously, you can go back and punch in areas and stuff like that. But yeah. the great thing, of course, when you don't have Gavin is you've got a plug in and you can draw it in and you can listen and audition it and then go back and go, eh, it's too much. Do a little less, do a little more, whatever it might be, yeah, and, and get that right. That's the functionality of digital that analog will never offer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's also you know, we we found that everybody likes to listen in their car, you know, and it would be great to be able to take this and put it in your car and be able to twist knobs sure. while listening, but uh, we found that that's that's too difficult. So we we came up with the idea of taking this this software and putting it on your iPad on your iPhone. So you can get all your settings in the studio, make all your decisions, run it out of the car, save all your settings, import it to, to your iPhone device, make some fine-tuned decisions out there if you want to make an adjustment, then take those and bring it back to the studio. And it eliminates this get, guess and check type of car test scenario. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, we found that a lot of people really enjoy using yeah, it. Yeah, we got into that. Well, yeah. plus if you, you also just pop in the earbuds if you're doing You can do that. Or you yeah. can listen in a, a PA in a, in a club, you yeah. know, anywhere. Yeah. yeah. And if you're listening on earbuds, if you're on your iPhone and, and you know most of your fans are going to listen on earbuds, there's a, there's a whole genre of music. There's a whole crowd of people where that's, they're going to make an album and just everybody's going to listen on earbuds. You have that opportunity to check out what that's going to be, gain structure-wise, EQ-wise, everything. So we built a plug-in to help take some of the decision-making away, you know, <laughs> and keep the standards up because we've got this experience that we like to bring to the table and we're proud of it and we take it seriously and build we build that in to some of this decision making process so that you can actually with your experience decide on other things sure. don't, don't get wrapped up in stuff you don't need to know you know i was saying to you earlier off camera and i strongly believe this and the reason why i love talking mastering is because when i was a kid i was a musician then i wanted to be a songwriter and then i wanted to be an engineer and then i wanted to be a producer and then i wanted to be a mixer but it stops there because I don't know if I can mix and master at the same time. I just can't because every decision I make is to make the mix the best it possibly can be. Yeah. I cannot, for the life of me, take it one stage further. Well, it's an interesting concept and question because we're seeing this more and more. And, it's, and, uh, and we're encouraging it too because people are mixing through bus compression. Essentially, they're, miss they're mixing through their mastering process. Sure. Uh, which can be a great thing and also can be a very dangerous thing if you go too far. The worst case scenario is where you have backed yourself into a corner because you've overprocessed, and but you but you're bound to that musical those musical decisions. You're you're mixing through something that's working on the bus that's gluing everything together, and maybe it's a little process sounding, but you're married to that at that point. You take it off, and the whole mix falls apart. So people call us all the time and say, "Hey, what should I do? Do you want it with?" Because they come to us, you know, and they ask us if they want to provide us the option with bus processing and without bus processing. Um, and generally, usually, depends on how hard they hit whatever processing they're using, their mix is their mix with the processing on. Sure. Because all their mix decisions were based off that. Do you like to hear both, though, to see whether you can take it to the next level? Certainly. Yeah, it's always good to have both. And we're finding that a lot of people are coming to us with, uh, yeah, you know. Mixing uh, through this. Yeah. They're, they're, they're it's a channel strip. They're using it as yeah. a channel strip. No, I like that idea. I like that yeah. idea a lot. And, people, and then we work off those mixes 
I mean, you take that off and we, you know, we get the mix without this, you know, it's, it's part of the decision process they made to end up where they did. Yeah. So we didn't think of it as ours. We just think of it as the mix that they sent. You sure. Know? That's absolutely yeah. right. And, you know, a lot of people call us up and they say, hey, I've mixed it. Everybody's happy. But do you want us to back it off a little bit to give you more room to work? And generally, that's a bad idea because, because of everything that Gavin just said. Everybody that's the gets mix used to it. And, everybody, and, yeah. and that's part of it, you know? So, there, you know, we've taken the uh, philosophy of, you know, some people say, hey, uh, some mastering engineers say, hey, you should mix everything with 3 dB or X amount of dB of headroom. And we take the, the stance of mix it to your best abilities and, 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 use, and, and don't worry about level. Go for music first, you know? Use your musical abilities to end up with the best end result you can possibly sure. come with come up with and uh, we'll take it from there and if there's a problem for any reason we'll get on the phone and we'll suss it out but generally if you take that approach you're going to end up in a good place because your ears guiding your decisions totally and and there's something in addition to this we're not fighting the level war anymore all these streaming services are deciding sure. how to change their output level which is sort of a first you know that it, it, it was always the level war make my music louder than the other guys and everybody wanted their music louder so there was just no end so you'd have to compress everything up into a corner, you know, the distortion level is the same for everybody. So it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller sounding. Um, but now that these companies are altering levels, you can actually go low, increase your dynamic range, and they'll, they'll take care of it. So the streaming services, streaming, I believe, is the future of music Agreed. consumption. I think there's, there's no way. Forget about the economics of it and how it's going to be monetized. It's going to be how people digest music, and it and it probably already is, as we sit here. You know, if if this imagine this is Photoshop, right? Sure. You really need to understand this to use this. You have to spend years and years and years just figuring out how to how to work on anything that comes your way, because every project that comes through our doors is different. There's not one project that's the same. Its own it's its own signature thumbprint every day. So if you gave everybody this, they'd say, "Well, I'm going to try this knob. I'm going to try this knob. I'm going to try this knob." And you'll end up in a place that's a little bit off the beaten path. Maybe it'll be cool. Maybe it'll open up some doors that weren't there you know, before. But you could completely mess something up and not know it you know, sure. until it's too late. Whereas we I have frequently. Yeah. And, it's, it's a, it's, you know, and understanding that, understanding how to veer on and off the path is just as much of, as the process as anything else. right? So what we did is we stripped it down and just uh, gave you the tools that you need to get the job done. And not so far that you could end up going off the path and not know it, you know. So essentially, the way I've always explained this is kind of like Instagram to audio. You know, I could teach my my grandmother how to use Instagram, and she could probably do a pretty good job. If I gave her Photoshop, she might have some trouble. All right, so we've done some prog rock. Yeah. Should we do something, uh, some EDM, some pop, sure. some hip hop? What do we have? So. We have this, this great artist that we work a lot with, and he's also a producer. His name's Finnessy, and this is one of his own tracks called Run. We've got an EDM preset for this. Um, we were thinking hip-hop might be, might be good as well to check out. They both have a tight, punchy bottom, and they both sound pretty good on their own, and uh, perhaps we can even explore a tweak on that. But I think the presets themselves, either or, uh, with some you know, critical listening, we could go. In, in either direction on that. Let's check it out. Yeah. So uh, what we're going to do first, we'll, we'll, we'll jump to this part of the song and just listen without any processing so we get an idea of what just the mix is. So let's try the EDM one first. Tightens up the bottom, uh, pulls it into focus a little bit. Um, but you had an idea to check out hip hop. Let's, yeah. check, let's check out the difference between the two, maybe. So now that we've got a good gain into the plugin, now we're hearing the compression mm -hmm. working. And from here, we can go through different preset styles and see what, I mean, before reaching the EQ, see what preset styles actually affect the EQ. 
Okay. Um, so this is EDM. See, that just works for the track. That film that kicked there. Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge amount of difference when it, the density was there. Um, can we can we A B just that breakdown section with the kick? Just push it out of the speakers a little more. Yeah. I agree. The yeah. top is the one for this and track. Absolutely. And once you find a good spot, you can play with even just going back a tenth and up a tenth on the input drive and see how that affects things. Let's go. This will just feel a little bit too oversaturated. Like right away, that starts feeling digital and processed. And then if you go one tenth lower. Not quite there. So it's like focusing a magnifying glass. You know, you just get to that place and you do a little bit this way, a little bit that way until you find this place that just feels natural and works. Very subjective. You know, what, yeah. what we're going on is, is the way it, it pushes the energy out of the speaker. So when you're focusing that, you're, you're listening for maximum impact. You're feeling it. And it's subjective. And there's no right or wrong. So it's we could disagree. True. You know, I thought in the beginning an EDM preset was great. He said, let's check out a hip hop. I listened to it. I agree now. Um, you know, we could pick if 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 you wanted to do something radical with this track, you could pick an Americana preset. You can mix anything with anything. We labeled them that to give a sense of what it is they would do. A little bit of tube stuff, a little bit of punchy stuff. So the description of the preset tells you maybe where to start, but you can go anywhere with that. Sure. And you just have to feel it. You have yeah. to feel the energy getting pushed out of the speaker. So preset alone is great it feels great and we can tweak on top of that yeah and you know you could say hey you're not even EQing it yet but actually there is an EQ a proprietary EQ set right here and it, you can notice that if you look here it's all frequencies are boosted mm -hmm. but I wouldn't even think of it that way it's 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 a natural arc shape curve that feeds into compression that has a smile face curve so they all work against each other everything works sure. against each and other that's part favor. of the preset that that that's comes part of with the, the preset. That's part of it. So, like hypothetically, now that we're in a good place right here, let me make a little loop here. Um, what I'm going to do is save this as a preset. I'll call this EQ one, and then I'm going to flatten this EQ relative to itself. So I'm going to put all bands at plus eight, and to compensate for the gain, I'm going to gain this up another couple tenths, and save this as. EQ2. And we can AB between the two. So back to EQ1. So EQ2 all of a sudden starts sounding a little bit processed and the, the clap has got that little bit of an edge that doesn't quite feel as musical. Now, sure. of course, this is completely subjective and it could be that you have a track where that flat EQ might work better, just right. depending on the arrangement and how everything's working. But that arc shape curve in combination with that compression just feels musical and natural. Yeah, I'm a, I'm, I suppose what I'm surprised with is that the, the EQ with more boost on it sounds more open than the one. <laughs> the one that has that's, less boost that's on because it. the curve that comes with the preset <laughs> yeah. is is part of that starting point sure. of the the chain yeah. the the uh, console chain so um, it's it's not you look at EQ that's been boosted but as Ruben was saying it's in a way we don't look at it that way we sure. look at it as flat we look at it as similar to the way you would line up a tape machine because everything is EQ on, on a tape machine alignment. Sure. You know, uh, when you pick your capacitors and resistors and tube or solid state or whatever the 
the electronics of the output of your tape machine are. And you start to line up your 1K and 10K and 100 hertz and 50 hertz and see how the bottom low end bump at 50 relates to uh, when you have 100 flat or if you line up 10K and yeah. 15K is up or down a notch. Uh, that, that essentially is what this EQ arc is. It's a mimic of that. So it's not really, you can, you can see 8 dB on the 3K. Mm -hmm. You're not you're not really hearing ATB at 3K. Sure. It's part of a a chain of events, mm -hmm. and it's a puzzle piece. It's like everything fits in combination with everything else, and it's all inspired how by how we work on this analog console every day. So all of the years in trial and error, figuring out how different shapes of EQ feed how, different shapes of compression, and how it all works together. And if one doesn't quite complement another, it's got some kind of rub or not this not this beautiful combination of, of a uh, chain of events that all works together. Wonderful. Um, just for, for me, can you play the, uh, just in and out bypass? Sure. This is bypass. <laughs> You have to hear through the level diff. I mean, when you're getting the limiting sure. in EQ, you're going to get the gain structure following mm -hmm. that. So the gain structure on the uh, input drive or the push is uh, where you have to really use your senses and just feel it. And you can start at zero. I mean, you, that, that preset will give you the beautiful starting point and an end point if you wish. But um, you know, once you get the chain, you're going to get some gain with it. So you almost it's it's almost um, unnecessary to A B it. You put it in, sure. see how it feels. How do you feel about the music? Mm -hmm. If it's not feeling right, maybe find some other presets. You can go back and forth, but you will have that gain difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Although what was, what was interesting and very pleasing is that the low end got tighter but bigger, but the mid range didn't get aggressive. So you can yeah. hear that even. That's the great thing about what I'm hearing is because Usually, volume is going to offend me when it comes to the high mids. But yeah. Like, do it one more time and I'll, I'll, I'll explain exactly what I mean. Here's before. So, that little bit on the crack on the snare doesn't suddenly turn into it had a potential before EQ yeah. to sound like, oh, that could get painful. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't. It actually got smoother. Yeah. And, and again, everything works with everything else. And, you know, some people could say, hey, well, why do you have a de in that chain? Well, what's the purpose sure. of that? There's nothing there that needs de -essing. But it all works in combination with everything else. So check this out. If I play this and I back off the de all of a sudden that clap might become a little bit edgier based mm -hmm. off everything that's happening. Think of it as a high frequency limiter. Yeah. Sure. All of a sudden, it starts starts sounding yeah. digital and less less musical. Yeah, definitely. but you put it right around here, and you can you can you know play with it a little bit. Maybe you want it a little open around those claps, depending on the mix. You know, in a case like this, we have a good mix to start with. The artist might may or may not come in and say, um, you know, I love everything, but my hand claps are really aggressive. You know, what can we do? So either on the plugin or even on the console, we can um, we can work with the the high frequency limiter or deesser, you know, um, and then push some EQ. That that aggression that you don't hear, it's the aggression's there, but it's not sawing your head off. You know, it's that kind of thing. You know, it's when we work we work on the analog console every day and. You know, we know it in our bones because we're just so used to it. We've been working on it for so long. But the advantage to working digitally, of course, is that you can audition and do those kinds of comparisons like we just did on the fly. We're taking, we don't have to print a track and then check it like you do an analog, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's a really useful tool and you can, you know, do it remotely anywhere. Another really uh, important thing is writing automation. Um, and to you know, in the, to save time, we already did a little bit of uh, automation that we can we can play for everybody. Um, so let me put this on on read now. So when when you have um, a lot of information in terms of a lot of power going into compression, your compression's working, saturating, mm -hmm. and as soon as the arrangement goes to, for instance, this this kind of this breakdown part where 
the 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 drums and the synths drop out and it's just his vocal the the arrangement is stripped down a little bit all of a sudden the compressors release right and because of that and this is the case with any any chain analog digital uh the the overall level comes up because everything's not saturating as much so we we implement doing rides we do that you know all day long on the analog console so we can do that with the virtual console too so you'll notice here that we've drawn some automation and backed it off and it allows you to then build it back up because you have to go down to come back you know so check this out <laughs> things you can do just for flavor you know right when it drops you can go a little further and then maybe just back it off right before that first clap and use the sure. clap to kind of almost get out of the way of the mix you know because the clap hits your ear and all of a sudden it feels louder even though you're backing it off so let's just play that one more time right where his vocal comes into that that drop Little tricks. Great, no, it's that like, dynamic range. Yeah, dynamics are good. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good sounding track. Yeah, yeah, he's he's props to Finnessy, yeah. talented guy. Yeah. Yes. When you get into metal and hip hop and EDM, you're getting into uh, a little bit of the less is more in terms of the saturation type mm -hmm. processing. When you yeah. get into Americana and Americana loose and you know some of the other more tube like sounding presets, sure. it's the you know we 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 picked one word titles for the presets to kind of demonstrate what what they feel like so right. they make sense by by what you pick so if you've got something like this that you want to saturate pick pick a, a preset that makes no sense for it and see what that does to it maybe it'll do something exciting and cool yeah and you can do that without changing you can just kind of jump through these different presets and your gain structure will remain the same so you can really yeah. hear how that compression is reacting like that that prod rock track we were working on it was cool to dig into some tube compression, you know, using the pop rock. My overriding feeling with this, now sitting with it for a bit, is that what you guys have done is you've created something that um, preserves the integrity of the music. Always. The, and I love, actually I really, I, I use IK's T-Rax for a quick fix all the time. Yeah. And what's great about that is it does a quick fix, but the problem is, is it's sort of like taking a sledgehammer to, to everything that I do, but it's the best sounding of the sledgehammers for me. What I, what I like about this is for a guy like me, if I have to quickly send it to a client, this is going to preserve the integrity of what I do. Yeah, we're having a lot of that. People, yeah. clients will uh, put it through this because, yeah. you know, a regular client will kind of get to know how we deal with them mm -hmm. and, you know, what kind of chain we start when we work with them because of their consistency. So we kind of know where we already know a starting point um, before they come in. It, with particular clients, if they work in a very specific way each time. So they'll use that chain as a starting point to send something to their client just to get a taste of what's mm -hmm. going to happen in this room. Yeah, that's great. And then they'll send that to us as well as the mix just to make sure we can have that as a reference point. And, you know, just like how we work on this console, the concert, console tells you where to go. You mm -hmm. feel into the processes. It tells you how far to push something. You push it a little, just like we were explaining or demonstrating a second ago. Push it one or two tenths more, all of a sudden things are not working. The elements are not connecting. Back it off a little bit, they're also not. You fine tune that place and it really shows you the different potential of, you know, the different potentials of, of, of your mix depending on the peak to average ratio. I mean, we can get technical about it, but it's also, you just feel it, you know, because we get the question all the time, how loud should I print? You know, where's the perfect sweet spot for whatever, you know, you're working on? And there is no answer to that. It's completely relative. It's its own. That was, that was a good answer. And I get asked that question yeah. all the time and I always answer the same way to everybody. And every mastering engineer worth their salt has that response. 
because people are like, I, I need the perfect level and I've read this and I've read that. And every mastering engineer that I respect says to me, just give me what you got and yeah. we'll make it work. This yeah. is, there's no perfect level. Yeah. Just don't give you clipping. Yeah, well, there is that you can overdo it. Yeah. There is that place if you go yeah. into that sure. place. But don't go to clipping. But. Yeah. yeah. Well, unless it's unless that's the intention, sure. you know. But um, but generally, you know, just use your ears. You know, let yeah. let your ears and your don't let your head guide you so much. You know, yeah. let it's let the, your your feel guide you. It's the same as what we were saying. You know, um, when we were discussing the working on this music, you, you can put a preset up, and if that feels right to you, then present that. Mm -hmm. You have to have a level of confidence in your field of work. So, you know, it's, you, you, you have to have some sense that you know what you're doing, some sense of confidence. So you can pick a preset or you can tweak it. And it's the same with the mixing. It's the same with anything down the line, you know. Great. How does it feel? People say, should I give you the one with the compressor? Should I give you the one without? Um, give, us, give us the one that feels right. It doesn't matter what you use. If you use some $10 box that you got in the yard sale to put it through to make it feel a certain way and you approve of that, that's what we'll work from. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much, gentlemen. That Thank was a you. blast. Thanks for showing us thanks around the studio it. and talking about the process and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if there's, you want to leave any questions or comments below, please share, please like, do all that kind of fun stuff. And uh, maybe I can come back to you guys with some questions. Anytime. Sounds good. Excellent. We're here. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing, and we'll see you all again very soon.